uh, continue where we uh, left off yesterday. Uh, so just to remind you, we're looking at the gradual, <coughs> gradual training uh, as it is found in the uh, uh, Majjhimanikha 27, the shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. And uh, in particular, the gradual training, it kind of mirrors the Noble Eightfold Path. So you see all the factors there. There's really the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, but here described in quite a bit of detail. So we have looked at the first four factors so far, coming up to Samma, uh, Samma Vacha, Samma Kamanta and Samma Vacha just before. And now we come to this uh, little uh, passage on contentment. And uh, so let's see what happens. This is page 27 in your, in your little booklet. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, again, because this sutta is in particular a talk to monastics, it is a little bit different from what you might expect for lay people, but it's still very valid for lay people. Just have to kind of substitute a little bit, uh, and it's still true. Uh, it can still be very useful. Uh. So, this is how it goes. They're content with robes, uh, to look after the body, and arms food to look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out taking only these things. They're like a bird. Wherever it flies, wings are its only burden. In the same way, a mendicant is content with robes to look after the body, and arms food to look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out taking only these things. When they have this entire spectrum of noble ethics, uh, they experience a blameless blith, bliss, happiness it has it actually, inside themselves. Uh. So this is this uh, nice little passage on uh, the idea of being content. And uh, here, of course, we're talking about monastics, about being content with your alms bowl uh, or alms food uh, and your robes. Uh, yeah, so robes look after the body, and then arms food really implies the arms bowl. Uh, and this is really only the basic requisites that you need pretty much as a monastic, those two. There are some more requisites, but these are the kind of the, the most basic ones. And you can get away pretty much with living only on that if you are very frugal. Uh, so very simple. And uh, you, it's one of those inspiring things, some of the, you know, the, if you look at some of the great monks around the world, they usually live very simply. Uh, uh, and they live almost up to this standard. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm always tells the story when he went to see Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Bhut Shah. Uh, he went up to his kuti, uh, and it's not often you got that chance to be invited up to his kuti. He went to his kuti, and he, one of the astonishing things was that there was nothing there. Uh, there was like an alms bowl in the corner, uh, and there was maybe a, a robe hanging over a, a rack, and that was pretty much it. Uh, yeah, and uh, so th it's still possible in the present day to live very simply. Uh, if you look at um, Ajahn Brahm's cave, uh, where Ajahn Brahm stays, also very, very simple inside. He just sleeps on the thin little mattress on the floor, that's where he lives. Uh, and that's where he lives, that's where he meditates and keeps a simple, simple life. So that's the ideal, and it's good to remember that as a monastic, because it's so easy to uh, have too many things in your cutie. If you have come to my cutie, for example, too many books in my cutie. Uh, it's one of the, <laughs> one of the downsides. Uh. So, uh, <coughs> but, uh, so basically, so good to remember that. So very simple. And this, we have this beautiful simile here, yeah? Whenever, you, wherever you go, you only take these things with you, your arms, your, your robes and your arms bowl, and that's really all you require, just like a bird. Uh, wherever it flies, wings are its only burden. Uh, yeah, so wings are your only burden. Wings are required. You can't live without your wings if you are a bird. Uh, wings are essential. Uh, and yet, in a sense, they are a burden, because anything you have is a burden. So even a wing is a burden, in a sense. So you, the idea here is that even for a bhikkhu, in a, in a sense, the robes and the bowl are a burden, because you have to carry them and look after them and all of this. Uh, but they are essential, just like wings are essential for a bird, in the same way. Uh, very nice little simile there. Huh? So uh, you take only these things with you. So this is the ideal. And what happens here, the idea behind this, well, first of all, this is very equivalent to right livelihood on the path, because the livelihood for a monastic is really your alms bowl. Huh? Yeah? So your job as a monastic is to 
live well, live according to the precepts, and then the um, lay people will usually look after you. If you live well, they will, they will look after you. Sometimes they look after you too well. <laughs> Sometimes if you get a little bit sick, you get lots of medicines. I know that from yesterday. You get this whole mass of medicines, which is very, which is very, very sweet. I, you know, it's very nice that people are so kind. Uh, so it's good. Uh, but uh, you can see how things tend to kind of go in that direction sometimes. You get a kind of glimpse of that. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can destroy Buddhism by being too generous. Uh, it's one of those strange things that you have to know that balance between right, the right kind of generosity and not generosity that ends up um, you know, destroying, uh, destroying what is going on, people becoming corrupt because of uh, too much kindness, basically. This often happens with some of the most famous forest monastics uh, because people know, that's what I want to give. Yeah? Forest monastics, they're, they're really good. And then because you give too much, you actually destroy that uh, uh, forest monasticism in the process uh, because they just get too much. Uh. So it's a very important point. So this is like the right livelihood, equivalent to lay people's right livelihood. Uh, this is what it is about. And uh, one point of this passage of contentment is that uh, uh, we have just been looking at right speech and right action. Uh, and now we're moving on to the uh, right mental attitude. Yeah? And one of the very significant, important right mental attitude uh, is to be content. Because if you are content, then it means you will have less craving. Uh, you won't have ill will arising so easily. Uh, so now we're moving into the morality of the mental sphere, starting with speech and body, uh, and now moving into the mind. So contentment is like the beginning, the transition into uh, restraining the mind and developing the mind in a positive way. Uh. Yeah, it's very systematic, you can see here. Things going in the right sequence. And you have to have them roughly in the right sequence. If you don't practice the earlier steps, uh, you're not really going to be very efficient, you're not going to be very able to practice the later steps because they build on each other. Yeah. And there's that simile I mentioned on the one, one of the first talks I gave you, the simile of refining gold. Uh, it has to be done in a certain sequence. Uh, get the sequence wrong and it's not really going to be possible to refine the gold or the mind properly here. So it is not an absolute thing. I mean, you don't have to practice kind of one thing to perfection before you go on to the next one, of course, because then you probably never get anywhere also. But it's a roughly a rough guideline to getting things in the right sequence. So here you are now beginning the development of the mind. We're seeing that transition from ordinary morali morality to the mental morality here. And um, then he says here that when this entire, sp when they have this entire spectrum of noble ethics, uh, they experience a blameless bliss uh, inside themselves. Uh, <coughs> So the entire spectrum of noble ethics is uh, like you know all of these things that we have been doing. Uh, it's called the sila kanda in Pali, and the word kanda is not ordinarily translated as aggregate. Uh, so you get this aggregate of of uh, morality or aggregate of ethics, uh, and it sounds very strange uh, very often. I mean, you can sort of get what it means, uh, but I don't think it's um, ideal translation. Spectrum is probably a little bit better because uh, you have all of these ethics. You bring all that ethics with you. Uh, and when you are ethical in this way, uh, you get a sense of blamelessness inside of yourself. And that the idea of being blameless, in other words, you have no regret, you have no remorse for anything you have done, uh, that in itself is a kind of bliss. Yeah? Because feeling remorse and feeling regret is oppressive. It's terrible to feel regret or remorse. It's an oppression inside. How can I get out of this? It's, you know, it's just, wow, this is just so unfortunate. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, there is a bliss that comes with simply the absence of having done anything bad. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, also at this stage, you start to get the happiness of having lived well, of doing good things. Yeah, you think back on the good things you have done, and that too adds to that bliss of blamelessness. So important to understand that every step on the Buddhist path, if it is practiced rightly, it gives rise to a degree of happiness. Yeah, this is the whole purpose, is the moving from one happiness to a greater happiness to a greater happiness. This is what this path is really about. And if you feel that it isn't kind of working or working too slow, 
then uh, uh, you have to try and see if, if where you are failing, because it means that you will be failing somewhere in these things. Maybe failing is too harsh a term, but it's, you know, we are so conditioned and so habitual, it actually can be very difficult to practice these very simple things. Uh, and a lot of people find they're not making progress. So you have to be radically honest with yourself and say, okay, here, I'm not getting this 100% right. How can I do this better? Uh, and if you get it right, if you get it better, this is the result, says the Buddha. You will feel happy about yourself. You will have less remorse and regret. And you will kind of be lighter in your step and you will be uh, you know, generally more uh, kind of content and happy with life as a consequence. So that is the uh, idea of contentment. And remember that here it is for monastics, but for a lay person it is the same thing. Uh, the idea to be content with what you have. It is very easy in lay life to uh, look for more things because you have the means to look for more things. You have the money, you have the opportunities to kind of do things with your life. Uh, as a monastic is more limited, you can't really do anything. And after a while you give up getting things, I suppose, uh, as part of it. Uh, but uh, in lay life, the same thing, same principle applies. Uh, yeah, you're happy with what you have, happy with your family, with your partner, with your uh, whatever possessions you have, and you kind of, okay, you carry on with that. You don't really have a great need or demand for anything more, because that is just so oppressive. Uh, it makes you restless, it makes you agitated, it makes you run around in the world doing things, trying to get this, trying to get that, uh, and it's an endless merry-go-round of disappointment and never really gets you anywhere. Once you start to get that, you become, okay, what I have is good enough. Uh, now is the time to focus on spiritual matters instead. How I live, rather than, uh, in other words, the, the attitude that I have towards things, uh, rather than what I have in life, which is so such a superficial way of living, really. Even though that's how most people live, that's, it is very superficial. That's the, that's, I think that's just the reality of it. Uh, but that I don't really mean that in a disparaging way, I just mean that that is, uh, I guess that is the Buddhist point of view of things. Uh, okay. <coughs> so now I'm going to have a look at one other sutta also, kind of as an interlude before I come back to the Elephant's Footprint Sutta again. And uh, this Sutta is called the Sutta on the Two Powers. Uh, it's another sutta that I like to read out on retreats because it is very kind of counter, counter to how many people understand the Buddhist path. Uh, so this is uh, <coughs> what the Buddha has to say about these two powers. Uh, there are men against these two powers. Uh, what two? Uh, the power of reflection and the power of development. And what men against is the power of reflection. Uh, it's when someone reflects uh, bad conduct of body, speech and mind has a bad and painful result uh, in both this life and the next. Uh, reflecting like this, they give up bad conduct by body, speech and mind and develop good conduct by body, speech and mind, keeping themselves pure. This is called the power of reflection. Uh, and what mendicants is the power of development? Uh, it's when a mendicant develops the awakening factors of mindfulness, uh, investigation of principles, uh, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion or samadhi if you like, and equanimity, uh, which rely on seclusion fading away and cessation and ripen as letting go. This is called the power of development. Uh, these are the two powers. Uh, so these two powers, power of reflection, patisankana bala, and the power of development, the bhavana bala. These are the two. Bhavana is a very word used a lot in Buddhism for meditation, meaning meditation. If you go to countries like Sri Lanka, the, the word they use for meditation is bhavana. And uh, it probably comes from this kind of context, yeah, where the, the whole meditation aspect comes under development of the mind, the second of these two powers. Uh, but what is very interesting about this is that the, the first power, the Patisankana Bala, this is how you overcome anything unwholesome. Anything unwholesome, yeah, whether it's by body, speech and mind here, it says here, and also how you move on to the wholesome, it's all about reflection. Huh? 
Yeah, it's how you think about things. And it shows you again the power of reflection on the Buddhist path. Uh, reflection here meaning things like thinking about things in such a way that it gives rise to right view about the world. Uh, yeah, like I was saying yesterday, the idea of right view is really where is happiness to be found? Uh, where is it not to be found? Uh, where do we kind of, uh, where are we searching in vain? And where are we actually looking in the right place? Uh, this is kind of right view. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons why when the Buddha talks about right view, he says that the right view of the, of the way the, what Arians think are happiness, uh, the ordinary people think is dukkha. What the ordinary people think is, uh, uh, is dukkha, uh, what the Arians think is dukkha, ordinary people think is, is happiness. Uh, so it's almost the exact inverse. Uh, yeah. And this is the kind of right view we're talking about here. Understanding where to look for these things. Uh, and that kind of reflection then takes you out of wanting to do bad things uh, and moves you toward good things. Uh. So it's not meditation as such that purifies you, especially from the coarser defilements. You can do a bit of meditation as a support, uh, but that is not what kind of takes you out of the coarse defilements of body, speech and mind. Uh, it is the, uh, not the meditation practice, but how you think about things, uh, reflecting in the right way, uh, understanding that these things really are problematic. Uh. So uh, this is, it shows you the power of reflection on the Buddhist path and how important it is. Uh, and without it, uh, really, you're not going to go very far in your practice. Uh. And then you come to the Bhavana Bala, and here it is, uh, uh, spoken of in terms of the seven factors of, of awakening, the Satta Sambhujanga, what you find here. Huh? And, uh, so, and of course the Satta Sambhujanga starts with Sati as the first one. Mi it starts with mindfulness. And then it goes to, it says here, investigation of principles, uh, which is like uh, uh, investigation of Dhammas, qualities you could say, is maybe a better one. If better way of translating it, investigation of mental qualities, something like that. Uh, and then energy, rapture, tranquility, samadhi and equanimity. This is all about meditation practice. All of these things kind of come out of meditation usually. Uh, you sit down and then the sequence happens. Uh, but the initial purification, actually a large part, comes from um, how you think about things. And the purification that comes in meditation practice is only a very subtle kind of purification. Uh, the very last remnant yeah, of uh, restlessness and these kind of things. The very ra last remnant of uh, desires and that sort of stuff. Uh, that is really what you let go of in the, uh, the very last part there. Uh, but the main thing uh, is how you think about things. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, it shows you that in Buddhism there's much more that goes on just than meditation practice. Uh, very often people meditate and think that's the end of the path, but not really. That's kind of just one of the many tools that Buddha lays down. Uh, and uh, thinking about things in the right way, very important. Uh, we'll come back to this later on because I have a few more suttas about this towards the end uh, in connection with dependent origination, how exactly this is done, how you think about things. Uh, but uh, a lot of those things I've spoken about already, like uh, yesterday, this idea of right view and how to apply that in, in, in many ways. Uh, in fact, most of the talks of this retreat have been on, kind of on that sort of right view, how to think about life and the world. Uh, so, um, yeah, so for that reason, there, I, th I, I always found that was, was a very interesting sutta and other people have said the same. So I, for that reason I, I thought I would just bring it up one more time. Uh, but now let's move on to the uh, next one. Uh, I'm going a little bit faster than usual because we lost one uh, sutta session. So uh, a little bit more. So now we can carry on with the shorter elephant's footprint simile. And uh, after contentment, uh, the next thing to come is what is called sense restraint, the uh, Indriya Sangvara Sila, as it's called in the Pali language. <coughs> and this is how it is described uh, almost everywhere in the suttas. Uh, on seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features, uh, since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil or uh, uh, bad, unwholesome qualities of uh, desire and ill will might invade him. Uh, he practices the way of his restraint, he guards the eye faculty, he undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. Uh, 
You know, this is the standard description of uh, sense restraint in the suttas, and uh, it is not, it, it's not very obvious what you're supposed to do. Yeah, it kind of this very short formula, and it says that you guard the eye faculty so you don't get these bad things of desire and ill will. Covetousness and grief is really a terrible translation, but um, <laughs> but again, it comes from this um, idea that you have to translate everything in a certain way. That's where it comes from, and that's why th this is the translation. But then anyway, so um, uh, you h how do we actually do this in practice? Uh, so um, again, I will come back to this later on, but f for first of all, let's just analyze what is going on here. Uh, so seeing a form with the eye, yeah, this is anything you see basically, the whole visual field, you see this visual field, you see all of these things in that visual field. And in that visual field, yeah, there will be anything within that field you could grasp onto. Uh, the sign might be the whole visual field, or it might be a particular object within that field, and that is the sign, yeah? or it can be any uh, subsidiary feature in that. Yeah, it might be a, a person that you're attracted to, or it might be a, a aspect of that person you are attracted to, or it might be something else, it might be a car that you find really, really nice, so I whatever it is. Uh, yeah. So uh, anything in the visual field that is of interest to, the, to you, that you grasp. So what does it mean that you grasp? And what it means is that your mindfulness doesn't flow, it means that you stop with that object. Yeah, you, you, you will know, everyone will know what, it, what it's like when you see something, maybe you either you don't like it or you like it, uh, and then it lingers in your mind afterwards. Uh, you can't really, it kind of carries on because you have an interest in it. Uh, you know, you go past that shop with some beautiful, nice uh, pastries or whatever inside, uh, yeah, and you look at it and you're a bit hungry and you can't get those pastries out of your mind. Maybe I should go back and get some pastry or whatever. I'm <laughs> this is often how it is, yeah, you see some nice food and you're hungry, it's very hard to get it out of your mind, especially if you're hungry, I shouldn't really have it, but I feel like it, these kind of things. Or you see something you don't like, yeah. you see maybe a person you don't really want to meet, yeah, because you have some difficult relationship with a, a person, uh, and then you, afterwards, it also lingers in your mind perhaps, that meet if you have to meet them or whatever. This is what it means to grasp, the mind holds on to this, it's not we doing the grasping, it's almost automatic. Yeah. It happens as a cause of past conditioning and all of that. Uh, that's what you want to avoid. Uh, you want to avoid that grasping, because if you grasp like that, it means that you are not really able to be mindful. You're not able to catch yourself when something else happens. Uh, you're not really able to be aware of what's happening around you. Uh, you lose yourself in the past, uh, and that is really the problem here. Uh. So you want to avoid that grasping. Uh. So, and... Uh, <coughs> the grasping, yeah, the, 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 the thinking about things, that then will often lead to these bad, unwholesome qualities of desire and uh, aversion, or desire and, um, and uh, like and dislike, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, either you like something or you dislike it, either you are attracted to it uh, or you reject it. Yeah, so this is what you want to avoid. This is precisely the problem. Uh, once you see things, you tend to give rise to likes and dislikes, and they linger on inside of you. Uh, and all of this time, you lose that ability to be mindful, and you lose, and you get dragged away, and you get um, uh, pushed around by the sensual world without really being in charge of your own mind. Uh, and this is what is the, the problem with all of this. Uh, so these things invade you. So because they invade you, it is these are quite strong, uh, Feelings, yeah, it's not just a very kind of small fleeting feeling. These are quite strong things that can arise uh, where you really get attracted to something. Uh. So that's where you we should start. Uh, as always, you start with the most powerful things in life, and uh, some of the most powerful defilements is always ill will and anger. Uh, that ill will and anger can come from the uh, from the aversion here, yeah, desire and aversion. Cro cross out covetousness and grief and put in desire and aversion instead or, or like and dislike or something like that because it's very misleading covetousness and grief uh, and uh, yeah so th so you it's, it's strong forms of this and especially the aversion and the dislike uh, can then uh, give rise to ill will and all kind of problems uh, and ill will is by far the most problematic of these uh, uh, emotions, mental qualities that we have, and that's why the emphasis often should be on 
uh, overcoming that, first of all. Uh. So you, because you want to do this, you guard the eye faculty. Yeah, you, you guard the eye faculty. What does that mean? Uh, it means you have mindfulness established. Uh, you know what is going on. Uh, yeah, that's what this means, guarding the eye faculty. Uh. So mindfulness is established, uh, and because mindfulness is established, you can see that uh, things are about to happen. Yeah, you can see that now I'm looking at something uh, and it's about to give rise to uh, problems, it's about to give rise to some serious, uh, uh, especially aversion, focus on the aversion of ill will, don't worry so much about the desire because that's kind of further down the track. Uh, it's about to give rise to something. Mindfulness tells you that because mindfulness is aware of what's happening in your mind. And then uh, you can take some kind of counteractive action to avoid that ill will or even to avoid that strong desire from arising. Uh, yeah. So this is what it is really all about. And what is that counteractive uh, action? Here it says you restrain the eye faculty. What does it mean to restrain? Very often people think this means using some powerful willpower, because that's what wi restraint sounds like. Uh, but when you see how the Buddha dealt with defilements in the suttas, he doesn't really talk so much about the willpower. Uh, what is more often talked about is the wisdom power, uh, how to have wisdom in regard to these things. Uh, so the moment mindfulness tells you something dangerous is going on, uh, then you reflect in the right way. And that is the best way to restrain. You think in the right way about the object. Uh, and the way to think is in such a way that that uh, defilement can no longer arise. Uh, yeah? So when you see somebody you don't like, you instead of allowing yourself to be distracted b by them, uh, you realize that, well, this is the nature of the world. Sometimes you meet people that you don't like, and you, you can't really allow yourself to be distracted every time you meet someone who, who is a bit difficult, uh, because if you do, you're going to be endlessly distracted by these kind of things. Uh, and you allow them to kind of pass on. You remind yourself that these people are like, a bit like robots. Yeah? They're kind of doing their own thing without your... Uh, and it has nothing to do with you, really. It's just the way the world is. And because it has nothing to do with you, there's nothing that needs to be resolved. It's the way the world works. It's a bit like the wind in the trees. Yeah, are you gonna? If there's strong wind uh, and it might be unpleasant, it's noisy and all that, but you're not gonna allow yourself to be too upset uh, because it's not personal. The wind isn't after you. Yeah, the wind doesn't think. Yeah, I'm gonna get this Buddhist. Yeah, they're trying to be mindful. Let's test them out. Uh, the wind doesn't think like that. Uh, yeah, probably the wind doesn't think very much at all. The wind is just there. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not, you know, or so because if you don't get angry with the wind when the wind bothers you, if you don't get angry with the earthquake when the earthquake or the tsunamis when the tsunamis bother you, and uh, sometimes they do, you might get fearful, but you're not going to get angry with them. Uh, in the same way, here is a person. Uh, they are a bit like that wind in the trees. Uh, they're a bit like that tsunami coming on the, well, it's got to be a really bad person to be like a tsunami, but you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, because of that, you don't allow yourself to get so upset anymore because you understand this is the nature of the world. The world is like this. And I, it's just silly to take it personally and to get angry and upset about it. It's got nothing to do with you. They are not, nobody's after you. Only people are just running on their own inner programs, doing their own inner habits. And you happen to be at the right, wrong place at the wrong time, and then you have to bear that uh, unfortunate consequence of the other person's uh, s uh, bad habits. And that's what happens. It's Im impossible to avoid it. So oh, this is what I mean by wisdom power. Uh, and the only way you're going to make this work for yourself is by reflecting like this. Uh, trying it out again and again, trying to understand these things from the right point of view, the point of view of anatta, non-self, the point of view of impermanence, unreliability, how the world is always going to let you down. Sometimes the world makes you happy, and that's why you have to be careful. Uh, because often when the world goes right, then we think, yeah, now I've got it all figured out. Uh, now I know how to be happy in my life. Uh, so we often become complacent uh, when life goes really well. Uh, so sometimes it's good to have a little bit of hardship every now and again. It's good to have a little bit of problems because it reminds you of reality. Yeah. And then you, um, uh, you this, so this is really how you uh, practice this restraint. Uh, occasionally you may have to use a bit of willpower. I'm not saying it's always wrong, but uh, this is the ideal way. Using that wisdom power to, to kind of, in other words, reflecting in the right way. Yeah. And uh, 
Maybe I should say, I always like to talk about why wisdom power is better than willpower. Uh, and uh, you will see this in your own life if you watch this carefully, but it's, it's fairly obvious really why it is. Uh, because if you use too much willpower to kind of hold down any negative states in your mind, uh, there's two problems with that. One is that it tends to be quite tiring. Yeah? If you keep on pressing things down, don't want to be angry, you try to hold it down, whatever, after a while it kind of exhausts you. Huh? And then, after it exhausts you, you can't really keep it up. And sometimes that anger may come back with a vengeance. Yeah, you really explode in a big time way because of trying to keep things under control. It's like a kettle, yeah, a kettle that is boiling and you can hold the lid down, but it doesn't take long before you can't hold it down anymore and things really explode out afterwards. So this is the problem with willpower. Sometimes it may work, but very often it doesn't. It actually leads to a kind of bigger problem down the track of can do. If you read a sutta called the Vitaka Santana Sutta, Majjhimanakaya 20, there's a very beautiful exposition on how to overcome uh, unwholesome thoughts. I don't know, I'm not sure if I included it here, probably not actually. Oh, it's there, okay, okay, great. So we're gonna have a look at that one later on. So that sutta, which is very nice, it shows you the various ways of overcoming unwholesome thoughts. There's only one way, out of five ways, only one way that includes willpower, and it's the last one, yeah? The last one on the five. And as always, uh, in Buddhism, the sequence is uh, important. So the first one is the most important one, the second one, the second most important one. So willpower is at the bottom of the list. Uh, and the two first ones are clearly about wisdom power, the uh, third and the fourth one are more about being mindful, and the last one is about then being uh, using uh, uh, willpower. Uh. Yeah, Big, if you use wisdom power, uh, the power of wisdom is that you reflect in the right way, and the moment you reflect in the right way, if it really is right reflection, uh, the anger, the anger or the ill will, bang, gone like magic, completely gone. Yeah. And then it is no longer there underlying it, waiting to come back again. Then it will be gone for quite a while until you meet, meet the next person who is difficult, yeah? Or, or something else happens. So it is gone for a while. And not only is it gone, but you don't waste much energy. All that is is a simple reflection in the mind, yeah? This is why wisdom is so powerful. The problem with using wisdom power is that it is hard to have that wisdom. That's the hardest part. Uh, so you have to develop that wisdom in the first place. But it is really worthwhile. Yeah? This, this kind of wisdom is incredibly worthwhile to develop. So come back to the simple wisdom uh, of how the world actually functions. Uh, and as you do that, you enable yourself to use these tools. Uh, and these tools become very, uh, very powerful after a while. And then you can really use them in your daily life. Uh, of course, I recognize that in daily life it is much more difficult uh, because in daily life you have uh, less chance to be mindful, There's, you're often too busy to really be able to kind of keep on your mind, you lose yourself in the activities of the day and all of that. Uh, so it can be, it, it is it's sometimes hard, but you can try. You can always improve, yeah? you can always make things a little bit better. And that is really all that is required. Move things in the right direction. Uh, and if you can do that, then you are, you know, you, it's, it's already, uh, you're already doing very well. So that is really what it is about. It's not about being perfect. It's about moving things slightly in a different direction. So if you find that over the years uh, you have become a better person, yeah, more kind, more, more of these things, uh, it's probably because you have been doing sense restraint. Uh, yeah? You don't even know about it sometimes, but it's just the brainwashing of the Buddhist teachings it means that when you come out there, you're doing sense restraint automatically. Uh, yeah, it just happens because you have, that's now your attitude. Uh, so if you find that you have made progress in your practice, uh, yeah, you are a bit more gentle and kind, you are a bit more mindful in daily life uh, and all of these things, uh, that's why. It's because you have been doing this for a long time. Uh, it's not, sometimes it's almost subconscious, you don't even know that you've been doing it, but it does happen automatically because these teachings, they are there somewhere deep at the back of your mind, guiding you in the right direction. And that is what right view really is all about. Uh. Yeah, please. Absolutely. I think yesterday uh, there was a question asked by someone, I think, uh, regarding what if, you know, 
you've been betrayed by somebody or somebody has done something bad with you and while we understand that uh, with a proper reflection uh, I think where the, if I may try to empathize where the person is coming from perhaps is yes uh, maybe philosophically I understand yeah no no self yeah. I reflect on it I, I do have that slight wisdom there but I think I think the challenge most people will face is the emotional aspect I feel that yeah. very strong emotion of betrayal and anger and all that I mm. think I think while on one hand 50% of the battles won by reflecting on the non-self and that people are robots and they're not able to know what they're doing and have real compassion yeah. for them there's another aspect within a person uh, that we that that is constantly bugging me for example uh, I may feel strongly this this sense of uh, ill will and betrayal despair so mm. that emotions tend to take over the the reflective aspect of the person mm. I think mm. uh, perhaps the question is uh, how then do we deal with those things and overcome when the emotions are stronger or when 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 it's really that bad yeah, uh, yeah. it's easy to to be <coughs> to be saying yeah i i, I know what about yeah. this but yeah. in the moment when you're feeling that way yeah. uh, perhaps that's the challenge that i think uh, we all face yeah, yeah. of course that, that's true that's very very true indeed and and most people when these things arise uh, they are not really ready ready for them and i think that is the main problem uh, so when the difficult situation comes, uh, it is often too late to start reflecting like this when the diffi difficult situation arises. Uh, because when the difficult situation arises, you are, as you say, you're overcome by all of these emotions and you can't really do it. So what you have to do is you have to prepare yourself for that. Uh, and that's why, you know, you, that's why you say that sometimes you have a hardship in life, you learn. And then when you learn, if you really learn through that hardship, uh, you actually learn those things right then. And then next time around, when there is a big problem, uh, and hopefully you have learned something about that. Uh, this is why good, bad, who knows? Uh, yeah, good, bad, who knows? Because actually, any difficult situation used wisely will lead you to become a wiser person in the future. Uh, if everything is going well in life, uh, you tend to become heedless. Uh, you tend to forget that these things will come eventually. And for that reason, you're not really prepared when they arise. Uh, so the, really the trick is to uh, you know, get, do this while things are going well and to understand things properly then. This is why this right view is so important. But for most people it's going to happen a little bit, but not all the way. Yeah, you're still going to grieve, you're still going to have a terrible time, you're still going to feel betrayed, you're still going to feel angry, all these things. But maybe a little bit less than you would otherwise. At least you see a way out, at least you have some hope. And then you use that situation to be wise and to learn something from it. This is the way the world is. Next time around, actually, it won't be so bad. So it is really about preparing. Once it happens, once it is there, there is very little you can do. You know, At that point, what you have to do is more use reflections like this too will pass and, and good, bad, who knows, that kind of reflections that kind of take you through it without you doing something even more stupid as a consequence. Like taking revenge, for example, might be even more, like be really stupid, yeah? At least you avoid taking revenge for what other people have done to you. Huh? I'm going to do the same thing back. Yeah, I was going to, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then it just makes things, you're kind of snowballing and, and revenge leads to revenge leads to more revenge and eventually this, it carries on forever like that. Uh, so this is, um, so you're, you're right, it is, it is, really, it is really difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, I like the idea of just uh, thinking about if you have been, tr been betrayed by your husband, uh, or whatever it is, uh, uh, then it's like being betrayed by an earthquake. You know, if, if, a, if a house in Australia, if, you, if your home burns down, uh, or if your husband betrays you, the emotions are going to be very different. Uh, yeah, it, it's a similar kind of thing. You are getting a lot of dukkha in the sensual world, but the way you think about it is very different. Uh, and uh, w when your house burns down, you don't feel any anger, you don't feel betrayed or anything like that. You just feel really sad, you sorrow and you grieve because of that. Uh, but if it is your partner in life who betrays you, actually you get really upset and angry, you feel really jealous maybe, or all of these other kind of emotions. But if you remember that the, your husband is like the fire in the forest, uh, yeah, your husband is like the wind in the trees, it's just nature really. 
uh, we forget that it's like nails. We think that there is so much volition and things coming in to the way people act. Uh, we can t you still may grieve that your husband has done it because maybe that's unavoidable, but you can avoid so much of the anger if you understand that these are natural forces, pretty much out of control. They are habits, yeah, and that's really all they are. Uh, but you have a point. I, I agree with you. You know, you're right. It is very hard to come to that point. It's, it's you are very right about that, uh, and uh, I, you know. This is uh, really why it matters so much to get that right view planted in there so you can deal with these things. Uh, without that right view, it's going to be very hard. Uh. Brainwashing, Brainwashing before, not afterwards. Yeah, or afterwards as well, but then it's kind of, uh, yeah, exactly. Get yourself brainwashed first. This is why there's so much grief and suffering in the world, yeah, this because of these kind of things. Okay. <coughs> So that's the eye, yeah, and then they have the same for the other six senses. Uh, on hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind. Uh, he does not grasp at its signs and features, uh, since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, bad, unwholesome qualities of desire and aversion might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, uh, he experiences a, a bliss within himself that is unsullied. So, uh, the same with the mind. Uh, so, when you think, yeah, the mind is also full of sensual thoughts. Uh, so the same problems arise in the mind as arise when you see something. So even when you're just thinking of something, you might get, get carried away, so you guard the mind as well. In fact, you guard all the six senses uh, pretty much sim simultaneously. Uh, and then you have the same kind of restraint. <coughs> <coughs> and that's the idea that one of those things that is quite unique to the Buddhist teachings, that the mind is considered a sense faculty on par with the other five. And then, uh, if you uh, restrain all of these things, uh, not only do you feel bliss, because you, um, because you, have no, you are blameless and all of that, uh, but now you feel a bliss that is unsullied. Yeah, the idea is that if you have desire and ill will in your mind, they sully your ability to experience the blameless bliss. Uh, yeah, they, they dirty it, they, they make it impure. So to have a, a more pure form of bliss, you don't want to have these negative qualities that, that kind of uh, uh, affect it in a negative kind of way. So the less you have these qualities, the more pure that happiness and that bliss is going to be that you experience as a consequence of living well. Uh, so uh, that is what that is about. So this is a higher kind of happiness than the previous one. Yeah, One kind of happiness after the other one, one better than the previous one. Uh, it's really, this path is really quite uh, extraordinary when you think about it. Uh, and sometimes we just have no idea how much bliss really is there ahead uh, on this path, how much happiness, uh, how, how kind of amazing this path actually is. Uh, you really have to just gradually, gradually move in this direction, uh, start to feel some of these things, and eventually you, you just think, wow, this, is, this really is uh, what I've been looking for all along. Uh, so that is the uh, famous passage on sense restraint uh, in the gradual training, and this here, now we really are deep into right effort, uh, yeah, the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, this is what right effort is about uh, in, in a big way, purification of the mind all the way. And we'll have more look at this later on uh, uh, to see how this is done in a, in a practical way. Here. Now we come to the uh, passage on the Sati Sampajanya, which is uh, here translated as full awareness, uh, sometimes translated as just awareness, sometimes as clear comprehension, uh, various translations. Uh, so this is what Sati Sampajanya is described as in the suttas. Uh, he becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning. Uh, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and ball, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, 
who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, yeah? who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, uh, waking up, uh, uh, talking uh, and keeping silent. Uh. So what is this all about? What does it mean to act in full awareness? And this is uh, kind of the critical thing here. The first point to notice here is that uh, all of these things that you see here, these are the daily activities of a monastic. Yeah? In your daily life, when you're not sitting down practicing meditation, these are the kind of things you do. Huh? You walk forward, you go into the village for alms, yeah? this is very much a part of this, you're going forward and returning, yeah? looking ahead, looking away, yeah? flexing and extending your lips like when you put out your arms ball, basically, yeah? Yeah, you do that sort of thing. Yeah? Wearing your and carrying your robes and, and bowl, obviously, has to do with that. Then the, the eating and consuming part, going to the toilet part, uh, and then all the other things, the walking, standing, and, and sleeping, and talking, all the things that are outside of meditation, ordinary meditation practice. Uh, that is what is meant by, that's when you have full awareness. Yeah? And the idea of full awareness is the idea that you understand whether you are doing something uh, that is purposeful as far as the path is concerned. Yeah? Are you on the right track? Are you doing something that is useful? Is this going to be helpful on the path? Or is it not going to be helpful? Uh, this is what this really is about. Uh, so when you, as a monastic, if you go into the village, the purpose is to receive alms food. Yeah? We don't really go into the village in the Bodhinyana Monastery, but I think Venerable over here, she, she goes into the village. She is one of the few monastics in the world who has a boat. She rows into the village to receive alms food. That's pretty, pretty cool, actually. I like that idea. <laughs> Maybe she can talk a bit about that later on if she wants to. So, um, um, yeah, so this, these are then all those things that you do when you go, when you kind of are outside of your meditation practice. This is what this is all about. Uh, and uh, for I in a lay life, yeah, this would be been even more important in many ways. Uh, so when you go into the village, why do you go in? Well, you go to receive alms food. You don't go to look at all the pretty things in the village. Uh, you don't go to see all the things that give rise to craving. Yeah, the city life is a life of sensuality. Uh, where you have kind of access to sensual pleasures. So that's, that's where you have full comprehension of why you are doing things. Uh. And the same thing in lay life. Why do you do certain things? Uh. To what extent is what you're doing suitable for uh, kind of going forward on the, on the path? Yeah? What kind of things are just going to lead to enormous kinds of problems for yourself? Uh. And you ask yourself that and then you move away from the things that are most uh, unhelpful. Yeah, such as uh, don't don't check your mobile phones, uh, you know, <laughs> all the time. First thing in the morning when you wake up, last thing in the, in the night when you go to bed. This is apparently what ninety. What is a very large percentage of people in the world do that? It's the last thing they do is the mobile phone. The first thing they do in the morning is the mobile phone. But these kind of things are can be problematic. Yeah, if you do too much of that, uh, it end up being dull. You end up losing your mindfulness. You end up being distracted and restless. Uh, so you have to be, so you need some restraint in that area and it's very hard to be restrained in those areas. Sometimes you have to take drastic actions to be able to achieve that restraint. Remember, willpower is very weak. That's what I was talking about before. Willpower often doesn't work. You have to use wisdom power. So if you find that there are certain things that are difficult for you to do, you have to find tricky, smart ways to get around them, to avoid kind of being trapped by these things. Yeah, I, I, there was an experiment apparently done, I've talked about this before I think, but it was an experiment that was done many years ago uh, in some kind of university context and they wanted to see why it was that certain people were able to restrain wh whereas other people were not. Uh. So what they did, they had this group of people uh, and uh, there was a kind of this beautiful kind of pastry shops with nice pastries inside and they were all for free. Yeah, they're never free in real life, but this was an experiment, they were for free. And so they had these people, they were supposed to be on a diet, not to eat, uh, yeah? and they were also hungry, uh, and they would see who is it that's able to resist the temptation of going in and getting a free pastry. Uh, who can resist that? Uh? And uh, it turned out that some people, a lot of people were not able to resist. Yeah? They kind of, okay, straight away they go in and get this pastry, uh, but some people were. Uh. And the difference in uh, attitude was that the person who was able to resist, uh, they knew that if I look at those pastries in the window, uh, 
that's that will be it. I will be done for. I won't be able to resist anymore. Yeah, that, that's that, then it's too late. The moment you look, you had it. But whereas those people who uh, were not able to resist, yeah, what's the problem with looking? Yeah, I'm just going to look anyway. It's not such a big deal. Yeah. They didn't really understand themselves. They didn't understand the psychology of human beings. Once you look, it's too late. Yeah. So those people who were able to do that, they, they didn't even look at the pastry shop. Then they could walk past. So you need to make it more difficult for yourself to be uh, have access to these things. That's really what it comes down to. So if you want to be more restrictive on your use of your mobile phone or whatever, then give it to your spouse. Give it to your someone in your family at 8 o'clock in the evening and said, I do not want to see this mobile phone until after breakfast tomorrow. You hide it somewhere for me so I cannot find it. Uh, yeah, or put it in a safe with a number, I don't know the, the safe number, whatever it is. You have to go to these really drastic steps sometimes uh, to overcome the, you know, that, that addiction to these kind of things. Uh, I'm not saying you should do this, I'm just saying, you know, this is one thing you, you can do if you really are, if you really want to, to do it. Uh, it's really entirely up to you, of course. Uh, so this is the idea of full awareness. You understand purpose and suitability of what you're doing. Is it going to lead forward on the path or is it not going to lead forward on the path? Because from a Buddhist point of view, the only thing that matters in life is those things that lead forward on the path. That's all that matters. Because this is what is going to move you towards more happiness and contentment in the long run. So that, that this is what this is all about, full awareness. So you avoid things that are bad and you have clarity about why you are doing things. Yeah? And uh, so it's very, these again are very high standards on how to live one's life. And uh, don't expect to do this perfectly, of course, but you can use it a little bit to give you a little bit of guidance. Some of the strange things here, just to point it out, it says here, uh, you act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep. Uh, actually, the Pali doesn't say falling asleep. The Pali says sutte, which means asleep. Uh, Jagadete doesn't mean waking up, it means when you are awake. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the point is you have full awareness when you are, not, not, not even when you are sleeping. This is kind of part of the problem here. You have full awareness in regard to sleep and in regard to being awake. In other words, you know how much sleep you require. You sleep enough, but you don't sleep too much. You find that middle way where you are kind of alert and bright, uh, and that is really the ideal there. So this is one of those uh, <coughs> translation issues, which is really kind of, uh, um, yeah, it's easy to get it wrong because the Pali is ambiguous. It can be read in two different ways, but actually here he has quite literally mistranslated it, falling asleep. Is, has a very different wording in Pali to say falling asleep. Sutte actually means asleep. And the reason why Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated as falling asleep is because he couldn't make any sense of how can you be fully aware when you sleep? It's impossible. Okay, so it must mean falling asleep. But uh, the problem is not falling asleep. The problem is not sleeping. The problem is the when. The when word is the problem. It is who acts in full awareness in regard, that is the correct translation, in regard to walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep. In other words, you know to what extent these things are done in the right way. All of these things can be translated as in regard to rather than when. And that gives you so all of those sentences there. And then that gives you a different way of thinking about this idea of full awareness. Okay. So I'm not going to say much more about that. If you wish to ask about full awareness, we could go into this in much more detail. But I, I think that's enough probably because uh, there's a limit to how much detail we probably need uh, on these things. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's go on to the very last paragraph of this, uh, this one here. Uh, possessing this aggregate yeah, uh, of noble virtue. Uh, um, Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, okay. Two different translations of the same sutta. Mm. Okay. So, uh, aggregate, yeah, the other spectrum, the whole spectrum of noble virtue, uh, uh, and this noble restraint of the faculties, uh, and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, uh, he resorts to a secluded resting place. Uh, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, 
a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. <laughs> a heap of straw, I like that one. <coughs> This shows you that you're supposed to be pretty relaxed, yeah? You go to a heap of straw and you sit down on the heap of straw. Huh? So you kind of, you <coughs> this is the kind of stuffing you find for mattresses and things, like sitting on the mattress. And uh, what this shows you is this is where um, meditation begins, yeah? This is all about meditation practice. Uh, you resort to a secluded resting place. Uh, this is uh, always has to do with meditation practice. Uh, that's where you do the anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, uh, and eventually coming all going all the way to the jhana states. And of course the point here, the important point here, is that meditation only comes at this point. Yeah, you will notice that sense restraint, even sati sampajanya beforehand, is not actually really classed as meditation. It is classed as the preliminary practices that you do in daily life to enable meditation to happen. Uh, so the stronger those preliminary practices are, the stronger your meditation is going to be when eventually you get there. Uh, so now only do you come to uh, meditation practice. Uh, so uh, really you should possess all of these things ideally as much as possible. You don't have to possess them completely obviously, otherwise again you may never get started, uh, but at least to some extent. Uh, and then uh, you sit down in one of these places, yeah? All of these places are secluded places, uh, far away, the mountain, the ravine, open space. The idea is to get away from uh, your ordinary setting, your ordinary life, yeah? get away from the uh, hustle and bustle of the wor world. That's really what this is about. Uh, and, um, and that's why when you go on a retreat, often you go on a retreat, you go away a little bit. Yeah? Maybe you come to, m many of you have come to Jhana Grove, for example, huh? and it's nice. When you go to Jhana Grove, you come out of your ordinary life. You get away even from your ordinary culture. The things around you are, things that normally are around you are not there. And it means that you can let go of those things a little bit more. Huh? And that's why this can be very useful to go to such a place. It is secluded. It is away from the ordinary things. Uh, there's Jana Grove is quite peaceful, except for the there's a road behind which occasionally you have a few cars, but it's not. It's actually often very very peaceful and very beautiful to stay there, uh, and that's why it is suitable. It's kind of a halfway house between being a monk and being a layperson, because uh, you're getting that half almost uh, almost the same conditions as you get in uh, uh, as in a monk's life. Okay. So uh, that is where meditation starts uh, and uh, then we will have a look, the very last thing we will have a look at later on today is uh, how that meditation progresses. Uh, once you get there, then how that meditation progresses. Uh, that will be the last sutta and that will be this afternoon at 1.30, I think. Yeah. So that is all for now. What happens next, uh, Bobby? Uh, is there anything that happens next? I think on the program it says something about self-practice. Is there going to be any interviews? Is that going to happen or is it not going to happen? Uh, it is okay. Yeah, up to me. Okay, I will follow your your instructions. Uh, what should I do? Uh, <laughs> interviews. Let's if okay. If that's supposed to be, then we will do it. Uh, yeah. Where do wish wish I will do it? Uh, okay. Good. So I will just go over there and I will wait for people to come about 